Uh, this is John Peterson. He's a historian of Dungeons and Dragons and of tabletop role playing. He published a book that you may have heard of called Playing at the World. It came out two years ago. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, I've read the whole thing, which is an accomplishment. And <laughs> it's, uh, it's a beautiful, wonderful book. Um, and this is Janelle J. Quays. Got it! <laughs> hey. um, and Janelle is a I mean, seminal designer. She's been in the tabletop space since the very beginning. Um, she's done a ton of work in tabletop games, computer role-playing games, and in a large parts of the industry. Um, and in particular, Janelle is also one of your sort of first primary examples of the audience of Dungeons and Dragons saying, TSR doesn't control this. We can play this game the way we want to, starting to do her own design work and contribute to the space from there. And that's actually a lot of what I'm hoping to talk about today. Um, so, without uh, much further ado, I'm going to sit down and we're going to start chatting. <laughs> uh, so, oh, uh, I was going to say, so uh, Janelle or John, either one of you, uh, I'd love to hear you tell us how you got into the hobby. Uh, I know John was not there at the beginning to get in, and Janelle was, so maybe we'll start with Janelle. But I'm interested in general in how people are. But before I hand this to Janelle, though, I, I did observe yesterday that Ten Ward totally slobbered. It was on this one, the one with the red. <laughs> 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 Cautious when you end up. <laughs> I'll go with this one. So, um, I've always been a fan of fantasy. Um, growing up, I, um, when I was in college, and we're, this is, I'll make myself old here, 1976, my brother, who was a, um, a war gaming fanatic, Fanatic. He's actually the game player in the family. Um, he was a subscriber to the general, Avalon Hill, working in magazine. And because of that, he had his name in the mailing list sort of things. And a company called Metagaming Concept in Texas, I think, bought their mailing list because they sent him a copy of the second issue of Space Gamer, which is one of the early I'll try and call it prosy, but really it's kind of a step up from a fan magazine. But it was for their game products. Well, in the product they reviewed Dungeons and Dragons. There were two reviews of Dungeons and Dragons. And my brother, I was working at a college radio station that evening, and my brother called me up and he reads these reviews to me. And you know in your life, maybe if you're paying attention as your life goes along, you recognize points where you understand that your life changes. This was one of them. I understood, I recognized at that point that this was a life-changing moment. And going forward from that point, I got, I ordered the games, so I could afford them as a college student. They were still, 10 bucks was still 10 bucks. So they, that was a big number in 1976. Um, so we got into playing with my friends, and the first game I played, um, a friend of mine in college had a friend back in her hometown who ran, was a dungeon master. That was a big deal. You were a dungeon master. And he ran games for people. He came over to my little tiny college in southern Michigan and ran a game for myself and several of my friends. And of course, I played Magic User. And I died. <laughs> so, but this got, this got us, this whole group of my, small group of my friends playing. And within a little while, we realized, you know, this is really fun, but nobody, there's not much material out for, there for us. It's magazines, but they're not really devoted to it. And we hadn't discovered the Appazines yet, and the dragon wasn't a thing yet. So I talked with some of my friends, and we wrote, I wrote TSR and said, hey, we've got this idea we want to do. We want to make a fan magazine for Dungeons and Dragons, and we want to call it The Dungeoneer. Well, um, I got a letter back from Mike Carr, who I think he said was the vice president of development at that time. And he said, sure, no problem. That doesn't stop on any of our trademarks. So, boom, I started producing this fan magazine, which, um, <laughs> it was, it, well, it was, um, I think the first one was eight pages with a, with a cardboard cover stock. And I, did, I was the primary designer, the primary artist, the publisher, production. But I did have some friends of mine because we were a small group and we called ourselves the Fantastic Dungeoning Society. 
we didn't think about the initials at the time, which were FDS, which was a very popular um, feminine hygiene product. <laughs> <laughs> so the other guys got to live that down. <laughs> um, pause, momentary pause there. Um, so we produced this and we sent it out for free. And we did the same thing. <laughs> list of like, people to mail it to from gaming magazines. And we actually got letters back telling us, never send this D&D &D crap to me again. <laughs> Little knowing that their hobby was going down and mine was going up. So that's how we started it. We started it with this little magazine that eventually became my career. Yeah, I mean, I'm not that so, so distinct from my experience, honestly. So, I mean, I really got into these games uh, in the 90s. And I started with a game actually called Vamp Vampire Masquerade. Um, uh, well, so, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me explain that further. I started playing this, this amazing trading card game that came out in 1993. It was called Magic the Gathering. Okay. They made a version of that that was called um, Jaha. It's like a yeah, slightly yeah. Different, different game. I guess they changed it to Vampire the Eternal Struggle. Uh, yeah. with some some concerns about the marketability of the term jihad in certain regions of the world. <laughs> um, you know, from there I, I got into vampire, into LARPing, and, and I found a group of people there who were playing variant second ed D&D, mm -hmm. who got me into D&D. Certainly I was aware of D&D when I was really little. I, I, I kind of admired it from afar. I wasn't super into that fantasy thing then. Um, but I always loved video games, and honestly I got into studying this because I became profoundly interested in where everything just came from. Like asking these questions like, okay, somebody at some point in history sat down and first rolled the die, and the result of that die roll was compared to a table, and the comparison that table ascertained whether or not it hit somebody. Somebody figured out how to use statistics and probability to determine events in the fictional world. And it struck me that this, in terms of our culture today, had to be one of a, a crucial turning point in intellectual history. And I wanted to know who that guy was. So I went looking for him. And I went looking for everything to say, where did hit points come from? Where, you know, where did all these system ideas come from? And so that, that's really what kind of started my journey back into these systems. And um, obviously, it's been my, my pleasure as I've gone through this to play a lot of these games. Mike Carr, obviously, was that co author of Don't Give Up the Ship when that right. war game came out and had the pleasure to play it under his personal tutelage. I played, you know, Gygax's original way lock and Gygax's house. Um, so, I mean, it's, uh, that's really kind of how I came right. to this. Um, yeah, and I actually think, you know, you talk about somebody first had to write those tables, and, and at least when it comes to, if we're not going sort of far back to the free history of war gaming, the very first set of rules that was published for playing games like this at all was published essentially in the back of a war game. Uh, is that correct? I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think we have slides. If you want to go through some of the slides, you can talk about as possible. Yeah. Like, so. great place to start. Okay. So there, and this is part of an argument, I guess, about what gaming culture really is. I mean, we all here think of ourselves as gamers, and today that primarily has to do with games we play on computers. I kind of went looking for when the gamer identity started, and it started from, unsurprisingly, a community of, of amateurs who had organized around, well, let's not just collect these like little red soldiers and stuff. Let's try to figure out what the best way is to play games. Up. So up on the screen up there, again, that zine. Yes. On the right is what I believe is the first zine. You would be astonished to just the explosion of creativity. A few people said, OK, if, if there are rules to figure out how to adjudicate combat, what should they be? And the, the dialogue that started in that community set a tone that spawned innumerable wargaming zines, innumerable wargaming clubs, and wargaming conventions. And that community is what actually drove all this. I mean, it, we're, we're always tempted to look at the Gary Kelly and Dave Martin and say, oh, this is all them, the great men on the mountaintop promulgated all this. But the truth is far messier, far more interesting, and far more inspiring, I think, that it, it, it takes a village. And this is the first village that I could find, was the people around wargaming conventions. Sure. This is another one for me. So this just shows an example of God Gax and Artisan. They were participating in this community. The left one there is Artisan's personal fanzine, Corner of the Table, which he ran from 1968 to 1972. If people here, people here know what Blackboard is? Is that a name? I see a few hands going on. 
So Blackmore was a, a workers <laughs> campaign with some fantasy elements that Dave Arneson ran about like 1971, up until, I mean, he still ran the dungeon up until, up until he died uh, in 2009. But um, he was mostly active in the 70s, and it was a campaign that took some of Gary Gygax's ideas, combined it with the idea of the explore dungeons, and sparked the specific collaboration between Gygax and Arneson that created Dungeons and Dragons. But it was all something that happened through these communities, through their local groups, and through groups like the Domesday Book, it was from the Castle Crusade Society, through a club that Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson participated in together. And this is how you sort of were uh, introduced yourself, you know, as your brother was a part of some of these right. communities. <laughs> right. He was, he was yeah, we, we lived in the back side of Michigan. Um, he was a high school student. I was first or second year in college. Um, we used to play out on hill games together. When he and I were young, um, we helped my dad build a pool table in our basement. It's still in the basement of my, my father's home right now. I don't think he ever got a chance to really play pool on it because we kept the plastic cover over it and covered it with our air miniature airfix miniatures and we made up our own rules that were basically as simple as roll a d6. You say this guy shoots that guy. If you roll a six, it hits. Simple rules. <laughs> and, we would, and we used to fight these massive military battles and at the same time I went through life with an I was always creating worlds. I mean, that was part of what I found fun, was I'd build these elaborate structures, I'd build um, places for my toys to live. So this was my background, is that my background comes out of a set of blocks, in a real sense. Um, do you think uh, that, to some degree, part of the, uh, the push towards the Asian community around this stuff is about that, really very much about that idea of exploring worlds that other people have made and sharing worlds that you're making with others. You know, a popular thing in these was uh, invoice and out of voice, um, almost uh, campaign reports, right? Uh, where even before Dungeons and Dragons, you'll have people rewriting how a battle went in their historical wargaming campaign. And then certainly when Dungeons and Dragons comes along, you know, that people are eager to share these worlds that they are playing with and their friends and find ways to get it out there. Uh, do you think that that's part of what makes community so closely tied to this hobby, is that it is a hobby that asks you to create these imaginary spaces? Well, I'm gonna go with the idea that um, part of what people tend to get into was one, they came out of the fantasy literature community in a sense. They've been reading Lord of the Rings, and really, until from like the late 70s, early, early, early 70s, up until the blossoming of fantasy literature, um, there was not a lot of fantasy stories out there. You had Conan the Barbarian. You had Baffert and the Grey Mouse, it was the pulp stories. So you had those, then you had the Lord of the Rings. Um, some other, you know, C.S. Lewis, but they, were, they were either children's stories or they were um, pulp. That, was, that tended to be what they were. There was not a lot of high fantasy. And you had these people reading these stories and really wanting to figure out how can I re recreate this? How can I be a part of this? And then they're given the opportunity to create these characters. And the characters start living in these worlds. And it used to be, I, we didn't necessarily write things up, but we would sit around and talk about what we did. Not what our characters did, what we did in these settings. And I'm certain we scared the living daylights. I went to a small group, conservative Christian college, and I'm pretty certain we were scaring the people there. <laughs> but, um, especially when we ran through the halls with swords. But that's just <laughs> um, But it was all about the idea of first person experience <coughs> of fantastic settings. For the, many of these people, this was their first time where they had any real agency in their life. This was them being hero. <coughs> And that, for me, for a lot of my friends, this was what it was about, being there. Yeah, you know, I really couldn't put that together myself. Um, I think what D&D offered the world was a set of tools that allows us to invent and to actually experience our own adventures. And this has been such a powerful and transformative idea. 
is, D and D extended this, this extraordinary invitation to create these worlds and, and as you say, to, to live in them. And then beyond that, it further gave us this incredible invitation to to collaborate on what 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 what, what magic item should be in there, what monster should be in there, what new rules should be in there. You know, originally there was no thief in the dragons, but you know, Gary Switzer called Gary Agax in May of 1974 and said, "Listen, we got your game in LA and we've been playing it, and you know, we think." You can play with this concept, and you've got like kind of a sneaky guy who knows how to like open locks and find walls and he, he backstabs, he does extra damage. There he's like, hmm, yeah, you know, that could actually have long legs. And so he wrote up some, you know, more formal rules and socialized them in a fancy, unsurprisingly, handed them out at Gen Con, uh, you know, as it was his wand. Gary was the great socializer. I would bring these right. ideas to groups and build consensus for them. If there's any singular gift he had, in my opinion, it wasn't necessarily his tremendous insight as a designer, but his writing skills. <laughs> his writing skills. <laughs> you can kind of go through a whole list of potential problems there. He was an amazing consensus builder. And um, that, that notion that took hold, that please, you know, don't let us do any more of uh, your imagining for you, it's from the last lines in the original Dungeons and Dragons books. People accepted that invitation. All of our culture today, I would say, argue this gaming culture is set um, I was just going to say, one of my favorite parts of playing the world is a little story <laughs> that discusses um, the sort of Pasadena, Los Angeles, um, sort of fantasy world community scene, almost like, early 70s, late 60s, I think is the right time. Oh, are you talking about Coventry? I'm talking about Coventry. Yeah, I mean, that's in the 50s. It's in the 50s. So. So, radically before this, again, comparable to when we see the working in Digest. I mean, one of the things that this Coventry episode, this is a very obscure part of gaming history and science fiction fandom history, but a crucial one because there's a very direct chain of influence from this that goes through diplomacy fandom. People here know diplomacy, the board game? Yeah. Um, diplomacy fandom took off in a postal incarnation in the early 1960s. Basically, all of the people who set the tenor of diplomacy fandom came from this Coventry game. So it's really essential because Coventry created the, the kind of concept that you would write about a coherent, fantastic world, you would write about characters. There was some control of canonicity, but it was a, it was a communal effort among a set of people who were interested in, in the literature, right? who were fans of science fiction literature. Tolkien was still pretty obscure in the oh, yeah. 1950s. Yeah. 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 I mean, his, his books were available in the United States, but only in a very expensive hardcover edition that maybe sold a few thousand copies a year. Comparatively speaking, when the first pirate paperbacks of Lord of the Rings came out in 1965, they sold like a million copies in the first year, and it went up from there. Were they Ace books? They were Ace, yes. yes. Ace. Yeah. So there was, a, yeah, there was some question of who actually owned the copyright. There's some right. peculiar legal thing of uh, what you need to do if you're in a foreign country and you want to get a copyright in the United States. Long story there, we don't need to go into it. But yeah, Coventry is an example of the new Tolkien one because they were deep in science fiction fandom. They were part of this culture that, that encompassed fantasy fandom at the time. Um, and they created this world, this world of Coventry, which is this bizarre kind of science fiction fantasy hybrid that a guy by the you know, standard they created. Um, and it captivated this community in Los Angeles that took to it and started writing different stories, covering different parts of the world, agency, different characters. And this is one, I think, of the signal influences on the community. We see Ted Johnson, who was a major contributor to that, playing a huge role in the early TNT fanzines in Los Angeles and alarms and excursions and so on. I think we have a lot of excursions. We do that. So this is two of the Kappas. Here, that's, that's, right. Right. Yeah, there is. that's that's alarms number one and wild hunt number one. Um, and then there was another one that was a, almost quite as, another one that was almost quite as popular. It was a British one called Troll Crusher. Yeah, there were probably eight of these. There was um, APA Dot in uh, New York. There was uh, Lord of Chaos, which uh, yeah. Nicola Shapiro oh, uh, yeah, ran out of San Francisco. So there was a whole cluster of these, and I would say that these were perhaps the, the most successful in the long term. Uh, Troll Crusher. Uh, that was the, the UK version of this that had been developed. Um, but these are an example of very early on in DMV's history. Our alarms number one that would be June of 1975, uh, Wild Hunt followed on February the following year. This is a great example of how people decided they wanted to have their own venue to discuss the right way to do gaming. 
And TSR had its official publications at this point. It was right on the transition point between the Strategic Review, which was TSR's early kind of primitive team, and the Dragon, which became this monolithic, massive, 100,000 subscriber, like serious, serious magazine. And, you know, but fans weren't content to just sit back and listen to what other people thought the rules should be. They took that invitation at the back of the D&D books. Don't let us do any more of your passion for you very seriously. But here's a question to throw out to the audience. When we say Amateur Press Association, who understands what we're talking about? I see one hand, three hands. Okay. The Amateur Press Association, the best way to describe it in modern terms is it's a discussion forum. Just like on a, um, a forum thread or a forum on any um, topic, except it took place over months. Um, because the way it was done was everybody wrote up their own page on a either a mimeograph master or a ditto master, which were cheap forms of production. Um, your high school, schools back in these days, that's how they printed out text <coughs> and handouts, is they were done either mimeo or ditto. So the contributors would write, typewrite on these forms and then send the forms along with payment into the publisher, and then it would be distributed to everyone who was either paying to subscribe or a contributor. And then, so conversations would go month to month to month, and they would get relatively heated. They, would, they wouldn't just be discussions. This would be flame wars. Since this came out of science fiction fandom, the concept of, of an APA did, um, you see a lot of evidence. It, even Rod Becker, even before he died, he was a figure in science fiction fandom. In Last Fest, in the same groups, actually, Coventry and Alarms and Inscriptions came from, um, he wrote a great article that someone, some enterprising person who studies history, needs to turn into a book someday. Um, not me. <laughs> about how so many of the tropes we associate with internet forums, internet discussion, were invented in the pages of those habits. And then this comes down to, you know, uh, uh, the, all the kind of acronyms um, that we would all be familiar with uh, for what it's worth, you know, it's FWIW, like there, all of these acronyms can trace back to it because you have these space constraints. Right. And the space constraints of your page or whatever you can trade. You to print that page. Right. And this is back when a dollar meant something. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I find it very interesting, and this is one of the things I love about the Coventry episode, it's just uh, that there is this strong thread in the 20th century of science fiction and fantasy fandom, where they, people really talk about these books. They talk about what they mean, they talk about their interpretations of them. When you come to Coventry, they talk about how they're inhabiting them and having their own stories in them. Um, and that seems to me so essential to the core of what Dungeons & Dragons and these games are. And I'm interested by, I, I, I know there's some individuals who sort of track from the fandom into the wargaming community, and I sort of think the ideas come with them, but I'm interested how this transition occurred, whether Janelle can talk to witnessing this transition, or John can talk about it historically, but how this sort of attitude that these are our worlds, and we can talk about them and share them, becomes something that the gaming community yeah, I mean, I'll say a few things then. Turn over to you. Yeah, I mean, let me make sense. Sure. <laughs> Certainly, I'd say that D and D thought it was a war game when it came out. You read the cover of the first printings of D and D. It says it's rules for fantastic medieval war game campaign. It sounds really intriguing, doesn't it? Sure, everybody here who saw it thinks there was rules for fantastic medieval war games campaign would rush out to the nearest retailer where you would discover it was unavailable because it was basically just by mail over that. But um, you know, the, the, the point is, the wargaming community was what it was targeted to. All the earliest advertisements were wargaming communities. Gary had little intuition anybody else would care about this game. And what happened, though, was science fiction fandom took to it. And there were some few points of connection between science fiction fandom and wargaming fandom. They transmitted this idea through the APAs at that time. And yeah, those people who, like I said, they didn't just want to read about these stories. They wanted to be in these stories. This is something that they always wanted. Nobody knew the right way to do it. Like Coventry failed for a number of reasons. It's a fascinating episode in history, but it didn't turn into some great success story. It actually turned into bitterness and acrimony, and people refused to talk about it still to this day. That's never happened to one of them. Yeah, it's never happened to anything in the game of I know. It's collapsed into bitterness and acrimony, my God. But, um, 
But I mean, you know, the, the fascinating thing about when D&D came out and word of it got out through these hackers and through, through other conduits in science fiction fandom, through conventions, those people came to D&D and they brought that desire to live in these fantastic worlds with them. And this is really, you know, this is a chocolate and peanut butter moment, right? Where <laughs> nobody intended for this to happen. Like the chocolate just got spilled in the peanut butter. And somebody tasted it and said, this is just, this is the neatest thing. Hmm. Yeah, I'm kind of going for, so when I, when I came into this, the diplomacy legacy was there. There were a lot of the, the old, old school guys were, had come out of diplomacy, and they all knew each other going back for years. So they, when they were starting to talk about, you know, Dungeons and Dragons or a few of the other side rules that came out, they already had long established arguments going about each other. So there was our, there was this community that started, but if you were a newcomer, you weren't really a part of it. Um, and to be frank, I really was never, I always felt myself on the edge of things at that point. Um, yes, I developed people who followed me, but I was never necessarily a part of other people's communities. Um, I participated in Apazines for a few issues, but just between school and publishing the Dungeoneer and really school. <laughs> um, I actually sold my, my fanzine because it got down to a month. It got down to, I was a semester away from graduating, but if I didn't cut everything else out of my life, I was not going to graduate. And I had a lot to do to finish an art show. Um, so we had to, we saw these communities develop. An interesting thing you talk about the science fiction community um, embracing or, be, or this coming out of an embrasure of working in science fiction. I don't know if this came across in some of your studies about the history, but it was perceived and that as we got further into it about 10 more years or so, that the science fiction conventions, while making accommodation for the games, were starting to be uncomfortable with them. Um, they were distracting. They were, you know, they were taking people away from the built songs and the. Um, There's no built music. Oh, okay. I need to. Okay. In conventional music, there is a type of music called a folk song. Well, in fandom, there's what's called a filk song. And in a real sense, if you're, you know who Weird Al Yankovic is, in a kind of a very broad sense, he's a folk singer. He takes existing tunes, sometimes his own, and he spins them off into a genre, whether it's science fiction or current events or food. But, um, the idea is the folk song is to take an established piece of music and often sing a song about a popular piece of fiction or a movie or a game. But it's more often, it was more about fiction than anything else. So, digress. <laughs> Back on target. Um, the science, one of the things senses we got um, as contributors to the science fiction, to, to gaming, especially as a game artist, to my point, that we were second class citizens when it came to the science fiction community. And we were allowed in, but we were not, we weren't full members of their community. Yeah, and I mean, um, you know, early role-playing games especially were kind of a wandering tribe. Yes. Um, the war gamers were uncomfortable with the uh, kids who were there playing with dragons. I mean, again, when, when the earliest chainmail rules were very bad acts for codes, adding Tolkien or Kogan-like elements uh, to war games, a lot of people said, this is, this is, this is a disaster for our hunt. People are going to think that we, we're kids doing fairy tales, and we're here doing a serious hunt. Our hobby is about historical recreation. You know, we're, we're making company of heroes, not making more Bradford. Right. And like, if you, you can't learn anything about actual history from playing more Bradford, you play company of heroes. You'll learn all about which tank models are being deployed at which times. And um, yeah, I mean, this is really kind of like their philosophy. Um, today, of course, you know, in Gen Con, 
56,000 people going yeah. to it. I think it's Worldcon, the big science fiction con, big World Con. Con. Like, World Fantasy. It's like 20, 23, 25,000 there. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there were taxis where I spoke you know, earlier this year, it's at 70,000. Um, you know, these things have gotten really. Uh, yeah, I think the world's been reversed a bit. Now, right. the game industry is just so much huge. The science fiction really picked up all the conventions. You have both the local, the regionals, and then the nationals. I guess that's the best way to put it. And the big, not everyone can attend the nationals, but they try to go to their, their regionals, which tend to be people who know more. Um, going to the big conventions is to get to meet people, you get the real people. Also, Oh, my slides? It's like yeah. You should have like two or three slides of how we're gaming. No, I don't think I. No, that's um, that's Forrest Brown. He was marked in that, but he was there with um, metagaming. Yeah. This is 19. The slides um, are roughly. Well, these slides are from like 1978. This is Origin 78 in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, I think the one above it oh, it was uh, Gen Con. 79, I think. Um, these are, is a local game convention, a regional game convention. It's in a university in Ann Arbor, or um, Rochester, Michigan. The guy on the left is Chuck Anshell. He was the publisher of Dungeon Dragon, or Dungeoneer after me. The gentleman holding up a sign that is the author, Alan Foster. Um, and then there's a picture on the upper right that is in cast of the Dragon Magazine on the left, and the British um, Steve Jackson, uh, who went on to find Games Workshop. Um, and then below, I believe that's my game group from when I was in college. Yeah, they had a slide of Alan who's a little long or somewhere. Yeah. And I had, I had those because this, I traded with them. Not that one. Not that one. This one. Yes. So that's Alan who's old. Games Workshop. The beginning of Games Workshop, everything. All that is 40K, all that is the, the heritage of Games Workshop, the gamut, that humble thing you see there on the left, it's first issue of Alan Weasel. Eventually, they discontinued Alan Weasel and replaced it with a magazine called White Dwarf, mm -hmm. um, which carries a lot of that kind of miniature, the hardcore miniature stuff. Later, eventually, but the early one, the early ones were pretty much hardcore Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, I mean, they didn't, they didn't, set, out, they didn't set out, even initially, here this is February of 75, they weren't even aware of it. <laughs> When Alan Weasel number one was printed, it's not until like number four that they first mentioned the mm -hmm. The thing on the right there is the, the first issue of the Judge's Guild journal. Yeah. Which you might speak to. Um, Judge's Guild. Okay, <laughs> Judge's Guild. Well, to give you an idea, I worked on the Dutch. I was, I was an art student, um, graduated in 1978, left, was, um, I had already sold off my magazine to another publisher at that point. Stayed in contact with that man through the summer to um, continue contributing to my own fan magazine. He continued to publish two more issues, and then that fall or that summer, he went to work for a very small publisher in Illinois called the Judges Guild. The Judges Guild has the distinction of being the first licensed pr producer of licensed material for <coughs> Dungeons and Dragons. They did. Um, gamer sheets, um, they started doing kind of adventures that were um, key adventures, something I had already done pioneered three years earlier, two years earlier. Um, so that is how I got one, my, my one real claim to fame is I'm either the first or the second, it's arguable, person to produce completely key playable dungeons in a print form and then sell them commercially in the marketplace. So that's, that's kind of my kind of thing. But um, my publisher, the publisher of the engineer, went to work with the Judges Guild. I was working as a graphic designer for a print shop and it suddenly became unemployed and needed work. And Judges Guild offered me a job um, being an artist and game developer. And I went on to write several of their game adventures, which John Chronicles in his, his book, but um, they ended up being some of the best published, best selling adventures uh, from Judges Guild, and one of them, The Dark Tower, is um, still considered one of the top 30 adventures for Dungeons and Dragons ever produced, and it's the only one that wasn't produced by TSR. So that's my claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, 
the Judges Guild Journal was basically their, their fan magazine produced that they, they would attach product, you would subscribe to it, and it was not just a magazine subscription, but it was a product subscription. So every month you got this journal of ideas and chat and talk about industry news, but you also got stuff. You got um, game editions, <coughs> ref sheets, um, dungeons, and a interesting concept called the city state of the world effort. No. Yeah, I can't remember which one. Yeah, but it was a this big fully heat city. And that was their thing. And at this point, TSR wasn't even thinking that we could do this. You know, we can't make adventures, we're not gonna make money doing this. And so they let people license it, and then Judges Guild proved that there was a community out there that was interested. See, this is, I'm gonna kind of go that this may have been the beginning of the fall of the, a lot of the individual contribution to Dungeons and Dragons already, because we went from everybody had to make their own stuff to here were these pre-made things that were, they were kind of like network television in the idea of creating a shared experience but we cut out, we made an easy way for people to not be creative, as creative in creating those. Interesting. Yeah, I might characterize it a little differently. Okay. I mean, so I, I thought, you know, the early Judges Guild stuff was this amazing subscription service. Right. And the reason why the subscription service needed to exist was because the original D&D booklets are famously completely incomprehensible. <laughs> and a lot of people came to TSR and asked permission, look, can I just like cut and paste your tables and put them in like a different order and then publish that so that people can actually play your game? Like, because it's impossible to do that by referencing your books. And if you look at what went out in the initial Judges Guild installment, it was an attempt to, to provide some rec sheets. We were like, well, here's some stuff and with, with TSR's blessing. That's right. It's unique. Right. With TSR's blessing, here's some stuff. Because licensing money was probably passing the proper direction, yeah. which is why it was not that But I mean, you know, here's some things you could actually just play this game. It would make sense if you did. I mean, the other fascinating thing about Judges Gill, it was their interest in telling the story, not just of a dungeon. Now, there's a term I use in playing the world. This comes from Mark Swanson, who was an early Boston hater. He used the term gilded hole describe what play yeah. in 1975 was, which means kind of like Diablo. Okay, there's like this hole in the ground, and your job is to go down there and kill stuff that's in this hole that has like gold, and to like bring that gold out of that hole. And that's the story of the game that you were playing. And a lot of early D&D was really reduced to that. It wasn't until actually mentioning uh, the two people who provided reviews of D&D in Space Gamer number two. One of them I recall was actually Tim Waddell. Tim Waddell was the guy who first, I think, sat down and said, look, you could play D&D like that. Or you could play D&D where there's this hole in the ground and beyond the general store, there's like a town. There's some people in that town. They've got like, things going on with them. Or you could play D&D in such a way, maybe there's a bunch of towns, actually. And there's like a story about what's going on in like, this whole area. And then the, the, the fourth version of this is that you could play it in the entire world. Actually, the title of my book, Play the World, comes from his description of that, of taking this beyond the Gilded Hall to the idea of uh, having an entire world that you're going to play in and experience and not just be a doubtful <coughs> cynical, let's go down into the dungeon and, and get gold. And uh, Bob Bledsaw, who ran Judges Guild with Phil Owen, um, he had this amazing gift for painting with a couple words, with just a little sentence, what's going on in every room in the town, the city state, the invincible emperor. You, know, you, you max this whole thing out, and everywhere you go, there's somebody who just has an amazing story. You wonder, this guy has one arm, but he's an amazing juggler. If you've ever played you know, a Squaresoft game and played Chrono Trigger, where you go into a tavern, and everybody you talk to there just has some shit. <laughs> that really all traces back to the seminal of the scope work. Um, I wanted to, so we've talked a bunch about sort of uh, some of these communities influencing each other, and Janelle said something that really interested me, which was that right at the beginning, the people who were interested in this game weren't welcome. Not, they weren't unwelcome, but they were they were marginalized in these other communities. Sort of felt like they had to come together and make their own. And I think it's fair to say that a lot of that pressure is what encouraged them to start the Judges Guild and other fantasy communities around us. Um, I am really interested by the question. 
do you think that that's just the natural response, that if other people don't want to play, we should come together and play together? Or is there something that is really inherent about this hobby and this game that encourages you to build community? We touched earlier on the idea that you want to share these worlds and want to play in them, and then maybe that's it. Um, but uh, are there other things? And then, as that extends, how does that reflect it in the, I think, you know, 40 years of ongoing tabletop design that we've seen since? Well, I'll throw on it. The, the nature of the way the games were designed was they really played best in an immediate sense. Which, when I say immediate, back and forth conversation about the game, not over, I mean, there were play by mail games, but these kind of said, okay, what are you doing now? Okay, I'm doing this. Okay, this happens. And so you've got this feedback conversation adjudicated by rules sometimes, um, and then you do it with more people. And I think it's that more people aspect that started driving things, because you went from, I have this idea how to solve this problem that the Game Master has provided, to we have this idea of how to put our idea, our various skills that are our, that we, our characters that we can do, to make um, this solve, solve the challenges of the Game Master. And this kind of naturally drove this bringing of people together. And then there was one of the ideas that really has to be carried forward in, in game conventions is the idea of the tournament dungeon. So one of the very popular ideas back in the, 50, the, 70, the 75s, the 70s, the, the, late, the mid to late 70s was the idea of a tournament dungeon. And I actually played one when we considered a national tournament at, at Gen Con one year. Um, yes, my team actually made it to the finals. <laughs> and it was a pickup team and the line to register. Um, but it's this idea of coming together and now testing your skills against how other people would play so that you could say that as players, we're the best. So there's competition going. So it would bring these gamers together. And then they found out that they liked doing things together in um, these groups. You started meeting other people, and you started sharing more ideas that way. But, and then you went back home, and you had these amazing stories to tell to the, the rest of the group that didn't join you at the convention. So I think they did. They did create this natural sense of, let's get together so we can share this idea. And do you think, and John, I would love if you oh. want to give answers, but do you no. think that there's something particular I, I love the way you describe that, because it's true, when you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, you're coming together with these other players, and you are collaborating, and in a challenging dungeon in traditional play, you've each chosen characters with different skills, or different abilities that you're bringing to the table, and it's the use of those, or the collaboration that allows you to confront these challenges, which, as I say, it sounds a lot like designing a game to right? You need a lot of different people who do a lot of different things to make a game, and if they come from different places and bring different ideas, the game is stronger and more successful. Do you think that that, I mean, that's a real through line, or do you think I just sort of created that right now? <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Um, so the thing is, like, since I also come out of the, or the origin of the video game industry as well, where one individual could create a game, and I actually put together one of the first team-based um, development team Rico, we, where we had to do that. We needed artists, we needed designers, we needed programmers. We couldn't, one person could not make a Coleco Vision game. It took a team. So that's, that, that's valid there. Um, I'm not certain if I could carry the metaphor much past that, but it was the idea of bringing the people together. I'll, I'll say, I guess I'll give, I, I think I agree with this, and, and I'll give a, a, a hostile meeting. Um, is to the more cynical dimension of this, just because I think it's important to mirror both sides of this. I think there are very positive elements of world building, and then perhaps and community building in that way, and then perhaps not so positive ones. Um, I mean, I think it's certainly the case that Dungeons and Dragons created a cottage industry core modules that take place in a coherent world, and we can talk about the world of Greyhawk, that would be the seminal one, and the innumerable world settings that followed that. And yeah, there, there was a moment in time where when Geek was first published, there was no like world. It was right. by, by it. 
But then, you know, I mean, when those early tournament dungeons, like the expedition to the Tomb of Horrors, or the expedition to the Barrier Peaks, which is at Origins 1 and Origins 2, 75 and 76 came out, they took place in Gygax's Grey's Grey Law, which was a successor to the world of the Great Kingdom, where Gygax and Arneson had previously collaborated in working times. And I think they did look at this as another source of revenue to describe a world that everyone was going to be engaged with. It was almost like a massively multiplayer world. Like, right now, 5th uh, and D&D has their, their, um, uh, their team lab setting that they're exploring. And this is a world setting that they want everyone to be engaged in. And this becomes another commercial dimension for the game. More products for you to buy, more events for you to participate in, to create stickiness. And you know, if there's only one Tiamat you could kill in the world, and that was the implication of the original description of Tiamat in Greyhawk in 1975. Yeah, I think it is a bit of protectionism. It is a bit of, sure, don't let us do any more of your imagining for you, but you know, I mean, if you really don't feel like doing imagining, we do have this whole world. And we have like 70 books you can buy about it. <laughs> or, uh, or during my stint at TSR, which was the early, early to late 90s, um, by that point, I think they had a dozen, or all, close to a dozen different world settings going, and it was crazy. I was the, um, the staff artist, or the, uh, the line artist for the Star World, which was the reboot of the old D&D known world, but in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Second edition, first edition, I can't remember. Yeah, it was basic experts. And then it's relaunched. And then it's re <laughs> relaunched <laughs> as in Star. But I was the line artist for the very short life of that, and then, just before I left TSR, I was a D&D AD &D line artist, so, um, and I totally, totally lost track of where I was going with that, except to say that we did have one of, one of the, fall, the falling down places in TSR, rather than trying to create this um, network television experience, which is where everyone's in the same place, doing the same thing, having this similar experiences, which is World of Warcraft, in a way, um, to a T. But they they kind of overdid it, and they gave you everything, soup, nuts, all these different worlds, and they all competed against each other, and people ended up choosing one and going forward and not buying the vast volumes of product in TSR. <laughs> the, the one thing I'd add to that, just because this is a pet peeve of mine, so I think it's hard for us to recognize from your stuff. I mean, I, I love World of Warcraft, you know. I did, I love classic. Oh, I think classic was sleepish. I did nothing but rate in Classic WoW. I wish I could still play Classic WoW. I can still play Mistara. I can still play al if I want to. Mm -hmm. I can still play 1980 World of Greyhawk. I think one of the things that we lost in that brilliant marketing plan that you were describing in World of Warcraft is those worlds are no longer accessible. It's okay, maybe they're private servers, and if I want to play with lines and things like that, I can do it. Um, but it's not something that is part of that culture beyond a very print element, where you really can do this for the older D&D things. And this right. is a, one of the big differences between the tabletop approach to world building and the, the MMO approach. Mm -hmm. I can say, and I think John kind of brings the point, is that there are really kind of a couple twin community in um, role playing games is now kind of, kind of four. Um, there is the contemporary community, which follows games like it, latest edition D&D, whatever it is. I, yeah, I know what it is. But. <laughs> <laughs> My point is, is that since I left TSR in 97, there have been, what, three editions, yeah. three and a half editions, whatever. And I have none of them. Um, but the point is, is there's this, there's this following the current trend of rules, which is um, the current edition of Dungeons and Dragons, um, the current edition of Pathfinder, which is the primary competing rule set to Dungeons and Dragons. It's not but the dominant, actually. I'm not going to argue that. Or you kind of flip over to the other side where there's this old path that's called old school role playing or retro role playing or vintage role playing where designers have said, okay, you know what we really re enjoy playing? was Dungeons and Dragons as it was played in 1975 to about 1980, you know, right up to first edition. And they've recreated these rules and they've republished them because they've written their own rules. The systems are still the same because you can't copyright systems. But 
So they've republished them under a variety of um, a variety of brands, and there's a completely valid community that is running in parallel to the mainstream market. It's a hobby market again. In fact, to be honest, the mainstream market is a hobby market again. Um, and it's gone back. Uh, do you think this is reflected in sort of when you look at tabletop role playing as an entire hobby? There's we've talked about these communities developing together and this idea that they can contribute to the design and that they form these fan communities and these hobbyist communities. And if you look at sort of the spread of what might be called tabletop role playing games in 2014, you have your story gamers and you have your sort of hardcore gilded hole gamers and you have your uh, you know OSR 1979 gamers and there's all of these different hobbies and people writing new pools and settings and worlds and games to explore each sort of one of these things. Do you think that inherently the way the hobby came together and is constructed that it does empower and suggest to fans that you know that what is wanted is for them to fall in love with one slice of this and to follow it to its furthest furthest extreme. Yes. <laughs> Great. It, it, it is, the thing is, is I think it was strongest at that when it was a hobby, not a business. And that's kind of where it's come back to. Yeah, I, I agree that there's a lot of tribalism at this point that surrounds all of this. There's a lot of my way is the untrue way, and everybody else isn't, and my God, and I have an equal for every before I dispute about this that I see on the places where, that I read on the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. I would not be bothered to sit here on the stage. So. Getting, getting the enormous salary I get for sitting here to talk to them. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I mean, I, I think it is. And it's, it's, there, is, there are especially that's unhealthy, I think. I think there are, there are validity to all of these methods of play, provided that they give us, again, as I said, the, the tools to invent and to experience our own adventures. Mm -hmm. And the fantastic thing about tabletop is nobody needs to like what your system is, what your setting is, what your game's about, except for <coughs> sitting around your table. And this is what you lose in the, the group thing that has to accompany a multi-million dollar, hundred million dollar video game. They can't afford to be artisanal in that way. And I think the vitality of that is what brings us back to tabletop and matters. That all those those finer distinctions of mechanics, I think, pale in comparison to that fundamental principle. If it, it gives you the tools to invent an experience, an adventure that people there believe in, it's a role-playing game that's good, we should encourage it. Mm -hmm. Awesome.